it's almost hard to know where to begin with China because it really, you know, as we were talking about, Ian and, and, and Governor Huntsman and, and Prime Minister Rudd as well, I mean, it touches absolutely everything. I mean, the Middle East, Janet Yellen's decisions, deflation, Japan. Mr. Prime Minister, can I ask you how you feel, how sanguine are you about the Chinese government's ability to handle um, the economic situation in their country right now? Two parts to the response. Can they manage a growth rate for the two to three years ahead? And secondly, uh, can they succeed in the prosecution of what is a well-prepared economic reform plan? On the first question of ensuring the growth rate stays in and around six, um, they are working on a range of measures now to ensure that's the case. And because you have the politics of the country at stake and of the party, uh, I believe that they will do what is necessary uh, and whatever it takes to bring about that number. Uh, the second point is if you look at the blueprint for the transformation of the economic model, which is a compre comprehensive document released just on two years ago at the third plenum of the 18th Central Committee, there are mixed results so far. So my answer to your question is do they have what it takes on growth? Yes, on transformation, full transformation, question mark at this stage because of the political difficulty of fundamental uh, state owned enterprise reform. Great. Governor Huntsman, President Xi just came here for a state visit, um, met with President Obama. How do you assess the visit? Well, you have to remember that this was Xi Jinping's first real state visit, and he had clearly had much different goals in mind than did uh, President Obama. Did he achieve what he set out to achieve? I think absolutely. Uh, as for the United States, it may have been slightly above average, but we end the summit uh, probably with a disconnect in terms of our strategic alignment around the big issues that matter. I'd have to say that the better than average aspect of the summit comes by way of both countries recognizing the importance of the protection of intellectual property. Uh, so the administration succeeded there, which means you frame the issue and now you can build content around that language, which will take time. And I'll just end with this thought. I think the future of these bilateral summits really will depend on to what extent the heads of state want to put real skin in the game because the U.S.-China relationship, I think, will become a head of state driven relationship. Expectations uh, prior to it were pretty disastrous uh, in terms of the things going wrong in the relationship. But from a U.S. point of view, a couple of things, two, th two or three things come to my mind. One, that you have uh, the outcome uh, on cyber, uh, which has been referred to in part by Ambassador Huntsman, as it relates to the uh, IP element as well. There's explicit language from the Chinese president in his own words on this subject, which we have not had before. Number two, uh, you then have explicit language from the Chinese president on that the renminbi will not be subject to competitive devaluation in the future. We do not have that language uh, from the Chinese president before. And the third one, is this fundamental uh, ground shift in Chinese policy on climate change, which is necessary for the planet, it's necessary for them, and their announcement of a cap in trade by 27, however flawed it may be in the, in the startup, is I think good news. So on those three ones, I see policy wins. Hey, uh, look, I, I, I obviously think that uh, there was some real progress here, given that there were some significant takeaways, even if the Chinese aren't gonna actually follow through and implement, let's say, on cyber, they can say that they moved the needle and they didn't have to push sanctions beforehand, which would have been a real problem for the relationship. They're becoming stakeholders. Look at what they're doing on China, uh, on, on climate, because they know it's in their interest. Uh, they're becoming stakeholders. Look at how much money they're putting into infrastructure around the world. Look at the commitment they've just made to peacekeepers. But they're not becoming responsible stakeholders because they're not taking on the values that the Americans want them to. In fact, they're actually competing with U.S.-led global architecture. And I think that's the crux of a significant challenge we're going to end up seeing between the United States and China. We can manage this as well as we want, and yet as the Chinese are getting larger, the willingness of both sides to uh, create condominium and an actual compromise on issues of uh, what kind of values, economic, political, and social, we think the world should be governed with, this I think is gonna create a lot of conflict. How can we engage China 
when it comes to the Middle East. But I agree that we share interests with the Chinese in the Middle East. I think one of those national interests is to try to avoid getting entangled in things that we don't feel like we're going to develop a win on. And I think the Chinese are doing a really good job of following their uh, national interest on that, and I think the Americans are not. And I think as long as that persists, it's going to be hard for the United States and China to actually come to terms here. There's no question that China very quickly is going to be the single largest economic and commercial driver uh, of relations in the region. That's very different from saying the Chinese are going to take on refugees. But of course, the Americans don't want to take on refugees either. There's actually a surprise. America's becoming more like China, its interest in the Middle East, than China's becoming more like the United States. And I think that that, of course, doesn't redound well for the Middle East. Uh, but it is an interesting way to think about how the countries are going to manage international uh, issues around the world going forward. Where does our trade relationship with China stand right now? We don't share between us a bilateral investment treaty, which to my mind would be the logical bridge between TPP, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which includes 12 nation states, 40 percent of the world's GDP, and China's version of TPP, RCEP, which is done largely with many of their free trade partners. And eventually, without a bridge built between TPP and China, which I think has to be done over time, you'll have a head-on collision between two systems built on different standards of trade and investment. And as, as one person who's very active in trade and investment in the Asia-Pacific region, that, that would be a, a disaster. So the time and effort spent between the U.S. and China on a bit, I think, would be hugely consequential. I think you're always going to have some disequilibrium, and American firms are going to have to learn to deal with that disequilibrium because the provinces play a big role, the federal government plays a fairly substantial role, and state-owned enterprises, as, uh, as Kevin mentioned, are a big feature in the economy right now. Right. Faced with reform, which has to happen, but not much being delivered on. China's military, China's posturing in the South China Sea, is that really different? I think it's important before you drill down into South China Sea posture, which is to understand what's the Chinese lens on the world, frankly, and what's important to them. The number one, two, and three priority of this Chinese government party is the items we began our conversation on today, which is how do you successfully transform the Chinese economy for the future? So the economic underpinnings of China as a global great power, as potentially a, a superpower, are set in place. That occupies so much, frankly, political time and energy and attention in Beijing uh, that uh, we need to take pause sometimes before we leap to too many conclusions about uh, dastardly Chinese global plans to do X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C. The only way through this is to try and get to a stage where all parties realise that there has to be a negotiated accommodation which jointly shares exploration and extraction benefits and leaves the territorial questions to be resolved at some future point in history. Is that in prospect? No. Is that the only way to get through it? Yes. Ian, is the United States mishandling the China relationship? Well, I think a big problem the United States has is that the challenge that China poses to the U.S. is not a military challenge, as I think Kevin just made abundantly clear. It's not a diplomatic challenge. It's an economic challenge. And we don't have the tools for that. Um, you know, the, the fact is that the United States does not do industrial policy well. There are many things the Americans are exceptionally good at, our Defense Department, the CIA, uh, the NSA, perhaps too good sometimes, the Pentagon. But, I mean, you know, if, if your kids end up at the Department of Commerce, you're like, what's that, the middle kid? What happened to that kid? <laughs> it's not... That's not where you want to be. We're not good at that, right? Um, but no, I really, I do, I think to your point, I think we're going to have a very serious challenge in responding to what is responsible stakeholdership from the Chinese perspective, but not from ours on the economic right. side. Shifting gears, Governor Huntsman. I'm, John I'm, Huntsman worked at the Department of Commerce. I know. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> what do the Chinese think about U.S. politics, U.S. president? presidential elections, and this one in particular. What do you think? It's, it's absolutely inexplicable. <clears throat> in English. Yeah. And then try it in Chinese. Right. And I have to tell you, having any kind of sensible, sane, realistic conversation about America's role in the world and how to manage the U.S.-China relationship in the primary doesn't get you anywhere. You get booed off the stage. And I think our whole political discussion uh, is tilted toward what to do to China as opposed to do uh, what we should be doing with China, which is a conversation we should be having at this point. 
Prime Minister, you said back in the green room, we know who's going to be running China in five years. We don't know who's going to be running the United States in five years. And, and that makes it difficult, right? Our Chinese friends have a deal of experience in dealing with the vicissitudes of American um, primaries politics. They've seen it all before, perhaps not quite as spectacular uh, as this one, um, but they have a, uh, they have a factored in uh, element to their reaction to this. They know that there is a circus element, they know that the circus comes to a conclusion. The problem is, if we see any of that theatric sustain itself into uh, the actual management of the United States government on the, qu on the core question of China. Um, everyone who is a friend and ally of the United States wants this country to succeed, the US. And I think the great thing about the difficult, hard road to economic recovery post the crisis is that it said to the world at large, including those in China, who thought that um, the American economy was finished, that in fact there's a great underlying resilience to this economy and you know how to bounce back. This has been a great testament of American economic strength and the resilience of your underpinning capital system. As the world's remaining superpower, and coming from another democracy as I do, um, the re-engineering of elements of your democratic system is actually fundamentally important for the future of democracy across the collective West. The slowdown in China's growth, economic growth, secular or cyclical? I think the real question, China will become the largest economy in the world, there's no question. When it does, the level of uncertainty around its trajectory will be greater than that of any major economy that we've ever experienced in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know what the problems are, they know what the problems are, but the impact that has for the Americans in terms of strategic thinking, make, thinking and decision making, as well as for US multinational corporations, is immense and hasn't yet been factored in. Thank you.